Andrew, you co-wrote the book, The Human Planet, Earth at the Dawn of the Anthropocene, which is the new age when humans are actually having an impact on, on the environment. Let me ask the question of, what do you find most beautiful and fascinating about our planet Earth? It'd be cheap to say everything, but just walking here this morning under the bridge uh, over the Colorado River, seeing the birds, knowing there's bat colonies, massive bat colonies around here that I got to visit a few years ago. I experienced one of those bat <laughs> explosions. It's fine, mind blowing. Uh, the the I've been really lucky as a journalist to have gone to the North Pole, the, the camp on the sea ice uh, with Russian help. Uh, this a camp that was set up for tourists coming from Europe every year. There were scientists on the sea ice, floating on the fourteen thousand foot deep Arctic Ocean, and I was with them for several days. I wrote a book about that too, um, along with my reporting been in the depths of the Amazon rainforest. I've been, uh, when I was very young, I was a crew on a sailboat that sailed two thirds of the way around the world. I, I was halfway across the Indian Ocean, again, in 14,000 foot deep water. We were just, there was no wind. And we were, uh, this is before, way before I was a journalist, 22, 23 years old. And we went swimming, and swimming in 14,000 foot deep water, uh, you know, 500 miles from land, the Western Indian Ocean, halfway between uh, Somalia and the Maldives is it like so mind-boggling, chillingly fantastical thing with a mask on, looking at your shadow, going to the vanishing point below you, looking over at the boat, which is a 60-foot boat, but it just looks like a toy, and then getting back on and being beholden to the elements, the sailboat, you know, heading toward uh, Djibouti. So the immensity and the power oh my of the God. elements. And then, you know, and then um, the human qualities are unbelievable. You know, the Anthropocene, I played a bit of a role as a journalist in waking people up to the idea that this this era called the Holocene, the last 11,000 years, you know, since the last ice age, had ended. I wrote my 1992 book on global warming, thinking about all that we're just talking about, thinking about the wonders of the planet, thinking about the impact of humans so far in our explosive growth in the 20th century. I wrote that perhaps Earth scientists of the future will name this post-Holocene era for uh, for its formative element for us, uh, because we're kind of in charge in certain ways, you know, which is hubristic at the same time. It's like, you know, the variability of the climate system is still profound without, with or without global warming. So this immense, powerful, beautiful organism that is Earth the all the yeah. different suborganisms that are on it. Do you see humans as a kind of parasite on this earth? No, or no. Do you see it as a um, as something that helps the flourishing of the entire organism? That can can intelligence that hasn't yet hasn't yet. I mean, is are is aren't we on a so the, the ability of the collective intelligence of the human species to develop all these kinds of technologies? And to be able to uh, have Twitter to introspect onto itself, of who's? <laughs> we who, get oh, we do. I, I think you know. I think we're doing a. We're, it's always, in a way it, we are. It's catch up. We're always in catch up mode. You know. Um, right. Uh, I was at the Vatican for a big meeting in 2014 on sustainable humanity, sustainable nature, our responsibility, and it was a week of um, presentations by like Martin Rees, who's this famed British scientist, a physicist who. Been on his podcast. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, he's, great. you know, he, he's fixated on existential risk, right? Yes, he is. So there's a week of this stuff. And um, the meeting was was kicked off by, um, I, I wrote about it, in the, the Cardinal Maradiaga, who is, I think, from El Salvador. He's one of the Pope's kind of posse. He gave one of the in, initial speeches. And he said, nowadays, mankind looks like a technical giant and an ethical child meaning our technological wizardry is unbelievable, but it's way out in front of our ability to step back and kind of like consider in the full dimensions we need to, is it helping everybody? Is it, uh, what, what are the consequences of CRISPR, uh, you know, genetics technology? And there's no single answer to that. If, if I'm in the African Union, I'm just using this as an example. CRISPR has emerged so fast, it can do so much by changing the nature of nature Will in 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 a kind of a programming way, not, you know, building genes, not just transferring them from one organism to another. We've only just begun to taste 
the fruits of that, literally. Um, um, and it can wipe out a mosquito species. We know how to do that now. You can like literally take out the dengue causing mosquito. The scientists have done the work and you think, okay, cool. Well, that's great. Uh, now it, there's this big fight over whether that should happen. Uh, African Union, and I'm with their view, says, hey, if we can take out a mosquito species that's causing horrific chronic loss through dengue, which I had once in Indonesia, it's not fun, and um, we should do it, you know? And hmm. Europe, What's the other side of the argument? European Union, uh, they're, uh, they're saying, using their capital P precautionary sure. principle, says, no, we can't meddle with nature. <laughs> right. And this is just like we were talking with climate. You know, there's the real-time question and the long-term question. And, and there's the uh, f people who are just facing the need to get through the day and, and be healthy and survive and have enough food, which is not integrated sufficiently at all into the climate, stop climate change debate. And those who like are trying to cut CO2, which will have a benefit, uh, you know, in the future by limiting the fat tail outcomes of this uh, journey we're on. So, so when I think about the Anthropocene, I think about this planet. I love that we're here right now. I love that our species has these capacities. I would love for there to be a little bit more reflection in where things come from and where they might go. Whether you're a student, a kid, um, uh, what's your role? The, the wonderful thing about the complexity of it is everyone can play a role. If you're an artist uh, or a designer or an architect or an economist <laughs> or a podcaster, whatever you do, just tweak a little bit toward um, examining these questions, stepping back from the simplistic label throwing toward what actually is the problem in front of me, whether it's in Pakistan or, or in um, Boston or wherever, you know, Florida. You know, what do you find beautiful about this collective intelligence machine we have? From an economics perspective, it's kind of fascinating that we're able to, there is there is a machine to it that we've built up hmm. that's able to represent interests and desires and value and hopes and dreams in sort of monetary ways um, that we can trade with each other, we can make agreements with each other, we can represent our goals and build companies that actually help and, and so on. Do you just step back every once in a while and marvel at the fact that a few billion of us are able to somehow not create complete chaos and actually collaborate and, and have uh, collaborative disagreements that ultimately or so far have left led to progress? Yeah, I, th I think fundamentally the point, uh, apart from the fact that you know we should just be joyful of the fact that uh, humans live here, uh, I think it's incredibly important to remember how much progress we've had. Uh, you know, most people just don't stop to think about this. That's and, you know, I, I get that in the you know, normal bustle of, uh, of day. But just, you know, uh, in 1900, the average person on the planet lived to be 32 years. 32 years, that was our average life expectancy. Uh, today, it's about 74. Uh, so we've literally got two lifetimes on this planet, each one of us. And, and you know, every year you live in, in the rich world, you get to live three months longer and the poor world is about four months longer because of medical advances, because we get better at dealing both with cancer and especially uh, right now with, uh, with heart uh, disease. Uh, these are amazing achievements. Of course, it's a very, very small part of it. We're much better fed. We're much better educated. We've gone from a world where virtually everyone or you know, 90% were, were illiterate to a world where more than 90% are literate. This is an astounding opportunity. And, and 200 years ago, 95%, 94% of the world were extremely poor. That is less than a dollar a day. Today, that uh, for, for the first time in 2015, it was down below 10%. So there, and, and again, these are kind of boring statistics, but they're also astounding uh, testaments yeah. of how how well humanity has done. So just on 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 the point of uh, we've 
kind of just been focused on making our own world better. Uh, and in many ways, you know, so we've hunted a lot of uh, big uh, animals either to extinction or uh, down to much, much smaller populations. There's much smaller populations of fish in the ocean. So yeah. there's a lot of, uh, of, of things that that sort of bear the brunt of our success. Not It's not because we're evil in that sense. It's just because yeah. we didn't all care all that much about them. Uh, I think it is important as one funnel of that. I, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Uh, but the fact that we're putting out more CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, because CO2, is, as you also mentioned before, it's actually plant food. Uh, you know, uh, if if you're if you're a uh, greenhouse grower, you know, if you put in CO2 in your greenhouse, you actually get bigger and plumper tomatoes, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's essentially what we're doing in the world. This has overall bad consequences, and and that's why we should be doing something about it. Uh, but one of the good side effects is actually that the world is getting greener, uh, so we get much more green stuff now. I don't know, and and this is where I show, sort of show my economist uh, roots, uh, mm -hmm. because if you just m measure all living stuff in uh, in tons, uh, so in weight, there's actually more living stuff than there were a hundred years ago, yeah. uh, because elephants and uh, all these other you know big fish and stuff are actually a really really small fraction of the world. Uh, so the, 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 yeah, the the fact that we have yes, so we have an enormous amount of live stuff, but that yeah. doesn't even measure it. It's mostly just wood. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, wood and green stuff that, yeah, has, yeah. that has dramatically increased in the world. Now, we're still not there from what it was in 1500. So uh, we've, we've still cut down the world a lot, but we're actually making a much greener world. Again, not because we really cared or thought about it, but just sort of a side effect of what we're doing. I think the crucial bit to remember is when you're poor and you worry about what's going to happen the next day, this is just not your main issue. No. You know, am I killing too many large uh, animals in, in the world? But when you're rich and, and you can actually sit in a podcast in, in a convenient place in Austin, you can also start thinking about this. So one of the crucial bits, I think, if we want to get the rest of the world to care about the environment, care about climate, care about all these other issues, we really need to get them out of poverty first. Uh, and totally. it's and, a simple and, point that we often forget. And get them connected to all the, these gifts. Yes. Um, I, I, I have these memories of, well, I was reporting on the next big earthquake that's going to devastate Istanbul in 2009. I was in a slum, a immigrant poor neighborhood, and walking around with an engineer pointing out to the buildings that were going to fall down. This is all known. There was an earthquake in 1999 and the next one's coming. One of my advantages in covering climate is I've covered other kinds of disasters too. So it keeps my context, you know, me in touch with other things we can do. So I'm walking around and interviewing everybody. I went to the school that's being retrofit. They actually were getting ahead of it there. The World Bank provided some funding to put in iron bars in the brick building. And and I, I met these kids um, and they came, when you're a journalist with a camera and stuff and a pad, you get swarmed by kids, uh, mostly in developing countries. And so these kids are running up to me and they weren't going like, are you American? Or just, they were saying Facebook, Facebook. <laughs> and I went, that's interesting. And I, they led me to their little town, a little community center that had a bank of eight or 10 pretty flimsy computers. Mm -hmm. And they were all there playing a farm. There was a game that was hot at that time on Facebook, Farmable. farm. <laughs> Farmville? Farmville, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, my son back in the Hudson Valley, I remember him playing it. And and I thought, wow, that is so freaking cool. That these kids, and actually I became Facebook friends with a couple of them uh -huh. afterwards. We traded our, and I thought, thought back to my youth when we had pen pals, I would write a letter to a kid in West Cameroon and he would write back. And it took weeks and it was a crinkly letter and I never met him. And now you can kind of connect with people. And and that, that all, through my blogging, you know, at the New York Times, I was doing my regular reporting, but I launched a blog in 2007 called Dot Earth, which was all about what you were just describing, the newest sphere, the connected world. That's a term from uh, these two earliest 20, a Russian guy in early, Vernadsky and a French uh, theologian and scientist, which is so interesting, uh, Teilhard de Chardin. They had this idea in the early 20th century that uh, we we're creating a planet of the mind, that that human intelligence can foster 
a better earth. Um, and I, I just became smitten with that, especially meeting kids in Istanbul slums who are on Facebook looking at connectedness. What can you do with these tools? Which is what drives me, you know, with my work now. And um, but then th there are these counter counter currents that if the connectedness can cut back, you know, it allowed Al Qaeda to recruit, use decapitation videos to recruit distributed, ex dis disaffected young people into extremism. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of, these systems are not, they're just like every other tool, right? <laughs> they're just for good or ill. And, and the efficiency thing, the, eco the economics of the world, which I also wrote about a little bit, you know, late 20th century, it was so cool that everything became so efficient, that our supply chains, just-in-time manufacturing, you know, uh, getting the the stuff from where the sources of the material are to the car factory and to get the car to the floor just in time for someone to buy it. And, that, it, and everyone got totally sucked in by that, including me. It's, it's great, you know, super efficient, cheaper. And then COVID hit and the whole supply chain concept crumbled. And, and one of the big lessons there, hopefully, and this is relevant to sustainability generally, is Efficiency matters, but 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 resilience matters too. And resilience is inefficient. You need redundancy, or or a variety of options, right? Which is not what co companies think about. Which is not what if you're only focused on a bottom line, short term timeline. Those disruptions are not what you're thinking about. You're still thinking about: Can we get that widget here just in time for this thing to happen, and then on we go? So it's kind of I love the noosphere. This newest sphere idea, the connectedness is fantastic. Oh, another thing, like in the early 90s, when I wrote my first book on global warming, it was for an exhibition at the Museum of Natural History. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund was involved. They were like a partner, one of these longstanding environmental groups. And they were very old fashioned. It was mostly lawyers, really, just using the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act to litigate against pollution. And now EDF is vastly bigger. And they're actually, this coming year, they're launching a satellite. A, an environmental group is launching methane sat. And it's providing a view, an independent view of where there's this gas. You know, it's the same thing. Natural gas is basically methane. So if you have a leak, whether it's in Siberia or in Oklahoma, you can cross-reference, you can ground, you can identify the, the hotspot, you can know where the problem is to fix in so many ways. And that's just one example. I'm like, if someone had told me in 1993 that EDF was going to launch a <laughs> methane satellite, I would have laughed out loud. So technology plays a huge role if it's kind of, you know, employed with these the bigger vision and leadership. 